think we're going to begin. Thank you for coming to our last lecture from our Design Media Arts Lecture Series for the Spring Term, presented by Louis Sandhouse, who I'm honored to introduce to you today. Louis once said something really nice about my work, when, uh, which endeared, me, or endeared her to me forever, because it showed me that we have similar philosophical interests and creative sensibilities. She once attended a lecture I gave, and afterwards she said my work had stayed long with her in a way that she couldn't define. She said it communicated to her at a sensory level, one that exists outside or escapes language. We know it, but cannot explain it. For Louise, this kind of communication was best described by Roland Barthes as the third meaning. Barth's theory points towards the existence of something which is meaning-giving but cannot be quantified. Put simply, Barth's first level of meaning is informational, the second is symbolic, and the third is significance that we cannot name, a communication beyond language. Whether Louise will speak of us today about Barth's theory or not, um, I am sure that we will be able to perceive it in her work. Louise Sandhouse is co-director of the graphic design program at CalArts, California Institute of the Arts, principal of LSD, Louise Sandhouse Design, and partner in the design collective, Dorothy Rain Sandhouse. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, starting in advertising at 14, her career has permutated through magazine design, corporate design, software interface design, books, website, and most recently, design for complex museum exhibitions. But teaching and design education are equal engagements. Her writing and work have, pu have been published widely. Her work has received numerous awards. She has organized a number of design educational conferences, and her work is in the permanent collection of the SS MoMA and the Bibliothèque Nationale Paris, Paris. Louise has an MFA from CalArts and a Laureate for postgraduate studies from the Jan van Eyck Academy in the Netherlands. We are very lucky that she is currently teaching a course in typography here with us, and with great honor I introduce Louise. Am I on? Yes. Rebecca, thank you for that very gracious and generous um, introduction. Hope I can live up to that. Um, I want to. I'm going to see if I can take this mic off because it's really making me nervous. No, because you're recording this. Okay. <laughs> so I have this echo in my own head. Um, well, I, I really appreciate all of you who came. Many familiar faces, and so I feel very welcome. Um, this is the title. Um, this is the subtitle. Um, hopefully, by the end of this talk, both the title and the subtitle are going to make sense. I'm obsessed with this animal. Um, there's something about it I relate to. Uh, people have trouble identifying what it is. I've shown it to a lot of people. A former student and colleague who's not here, who had to write poetry, um, set me a list of possibilities uh, Dior Doggis, Capybara, Pigmalope, Chupacabra, Spotted Hodgepodge, or Tommy Leaf Feeder. My friend Denise finally helped me identify it. It's called a Munchak also known as a barking deer. I also relate to this image. There I am doing the dance of graphic design, and my audience is trying to guess what the dance is, because it doesn't look like anything they think of as graphic design. This is a quote from a group of architects in London called Archigram. Um, they practiced in the 60s. The group challenged existing models of design practice because they seemed inappropriate for the culture in which they were living. Hopefully this statement will linger in the background as I show my work. 
So it reads, when you're looking for a solution to what you have been told is an architectural problem, the solution may not be a building. Of course, I'm relating that to my practice as a graphic designer. Um, this is my practice. Um, as uh, Rebecca described, I have, uh, I have uh, a collective. I'm part of a collective. I have Louise Sandhouse Design, also known as LSD, and I'm co-director of the graphic design program. So this group kind of permutates uh, as we uh, have different projects that require different skills and different sensibilities. Um, I'm going to show you, I'm going to lead into what our cards actually look like because I think they sort of tell the story of how we operate. But I wanted to show you um, some of the, uh, the studies that we did to try and figure out what our business card would look like. So uh, this one here, these are actually um, little, uh, we would get a punch made and we just uh, stamp out uh, our names depending on who was working on a project. And there would be uh, versions of the card printed with uh, the different addresses. In this version, uh, you just tear off bits. So uh, it just walks you through the steps here. So this card could be torn in half so that it could just represent Durfee Rain. And then if Tim was working on his own, he could just tear off Iris there. Then uh, this was uh, on uh, like uh, adhesive back paper. So uh, here's everything uh, uh, attached and then parts are beginning to be peeled off depending on uh, how much information we want on the card. there. So here's what our cards actually look like. Um, so here's the set in all the configurations of how we work. And of course I didn't put my CalArts card up there. So I'm going to go through um, a number of projects here. And I wanted to actually start with this one because it was sort of a seminal project for me. Um, this was a project that I did while I was a participant, otherwise known as student, at the Jan van Eyck Academy, which was in Maastricht in the Netherlands. This was in 1995. And what was pretty amazing about being there was that you could, um, you could pretty much do what you wanted to do. You could like take on a big project and really execute it. And my big project while I was there was to produce this conference. Um, my shtick has really been about how the practice of graphic design is evolving, both from a pedagogical standpoint as well as a practice standpoint as something that's very interrelated. And so I um, produced this, this symposium while I was there. This is the poster that um, another participant and I did together, a woman named Femke Snelsing. Um, and the way that this poster actually happened was it was a, its origins was a PDF and it would be sent out to um, people on our list who would receive it as a PDF and could output it as pages and then just have it as a booklet that was a reference about the symposium or they could configure it into their own poster. So when we sent this to the printer, we actually sent film for each of the pages, which is what we would think of as eight and a half by eleven, but they were actually A4. And the printer, we just told the printer to configure it any way they wanted. So there seems like there's a, a proper configuration that somehow you could work out these pieces so that they form whole images, but they actually don't. And this was, this was seminal for me because it, it started me thinking about uh, different models for practicing as a graphic designer, about what I was producing. Again, back to this reference of it, maybe it wasn't a building. So instead of going straight to a poster, so it was just thinking about what the circumstances were and what the technology was and what might be produced. Um, this, is, this is an oddball. I did spend many years of my career working for Corporate America. And this is a vestige of it, which was actually a pretty important project for me. It's, I started this project right out of graduate school. 
in 1994, when I, I knew that what I wanted to do had something to do with education. I started working for a company called Internal and External Communications. And they had this project from PepsiCo, also called Tricon, also at the time was Taco Bell, which I thought, in my <laughs> never in my life would I do this again after graduate school, and there I was. But what was really interesting was that I was working with a technology person who I had a great relationship with. So he was sort of the head of this project. And what we quickly discovered was that I couldn't design the interface for the software without simultaneously designing the software itself. And so what we did was we figured out how the teams would, um, would work together very symbi symbiotically so that the process of designing the interface was intimately tied in to how the software functioned. And this actually became a model for a lot of how I worked after that. Um, this is a little um, quick time movie, so this will just run through this thing, which um, is with, uh, it's dedicated software for PepsiCo to help run operations in their restaurants. Um, this was actually made for people who, uh, who uh, had never, never even used a computer. So it's all touch screen, and that's why everything is kind of big and clunky here. Um, but uh, it also had to use almost no screen space at all. So the space in the middle here, I'm going to go back to that for just a minute, maybe. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. So this space in here was actually where they could, other softwares could appear. Um, this would actually move up here. So I had like, I don't know, 12 pixels of screen space to actually design this interface in. Um, this actually took five years, believe it or not, to design it. It just kept iterating and iterating and iterating and taking up less screen space until it was finally um, down to what you saw. Um, it went all the way to that set building before the project was killed. Five years of my life. Um, this next project, I, I put this in the order of following up the, uh, the PepsiCo project because, believe it or not, I think I got this project because of the PepsiCo project. It was this kind of <laughs> revelation. This is for the LA County Museum of Art, really a mega show, which I'll describe in a minute. But I think I actually got this because the way that I was thinking about building an interface could be applied to any kind of production, any kind of large-scale production, actually sort of seeing it, as I described with that software, where you just sort of building what it is and what people are seeing and how they're navigating and how they're operating through it simultaneously. So we actually started working very early on with the client to build the concept of the exhibition simultaneously with actually designing the exhibition itself. Um, I would say this is medium successful, and I'm actually going to show you only a few of the features. This is what we had to design, 50,000 square feet, which is the size of several <laughs> small museums, which was five floors of galleries. It was two buildings within the institution, five section intros, five timeline image walls, the information architecture, all the audio and visual work, the wayfinding, the reading rooms, the exhibition entrance, the environmental graphics, the lifestyle environment, the plaza, and the excellent audio installation. This was a project that took about two and a half years for us to do. And this was the first exhibition that we had ever done. And this is where I formed my partnership with Dorothy Bray and Santos. Um, this is the entrance, um, what we call the hub. And we built this uh, structure, which you're just seeing part of, to help um, bring together uh, the two disparate buildings. Um, we also wanted to introduce the exhibition. I'm going to show you some other images here by introducing the idea of California as a place. So we took 
all these cliched images of California. And they're actually on the screen, as you see here, that was wrapping the building. So this is the configuration of the scrim. Um, and what would happen is as the lighting would change during the day, and we actually had lighting on this, that the persona of the images would be inflected so that the connotations of these images as just um, uh, images that, uh, you know, the, the, the sunny brightness, uh, the glowing desert, the lovely sunset began to take on other inflections or other meanings. Um, we, there was a whole system that we designed, a whole language, I'm just showing you really a small part of it here, of uh, materials and colors. Um, we actually took those images that you saw and reduced them down to the, to the most pixels. And that's how we ended up with this color range here. So there were five sections of the exhibition, and each one had a color palette and a materials palette. Again, we tried to get away from what the cliches of that period might be and actually take on some more complex meanings for each of these five periods. The periods were 20-year uh, 20 20 year period starting from 1900 and going up to 2000. So we had everything from uh, uh, birch and felt, uh, wood, oak, and uh, a fiber laminate, plastic and lycra, melite and rubber, and then here we had this uh, recycled burl material, this Dakota burl. This is the entrance of the exhibition. Now, I think I only see one student of mine here. No, two students. Three students. Well, UCLA students, although you count Elizabeth. Um, but I had mentioned this, here it goes, um, because uh, I gave my class here a project where they had to learn after effects and like do a little project in a couple of weeks. And I, I was here in morning morning and I said, I had a week to create five videos. So I did not know after effects and literally had one week to produce these five charming videos here. Um, these were used to introduce the five sections of the exhibition so that hopefully, hopefully people would get an idea of what the images looked like. Now this exhibition was actually about the relationship of California art to images of California. So what those images are that we have in our mind um, are, are um, represented but also expanded so that a more generous idea of what actually was going on in California through the century could be played out through this exhibition. So we actually experienced the media like this. It was actually moving. And there was actually, there was a material here called Lumisti, which as you moved uh, across the front of this, as you were walking by, all of the only the monitor in which you were in front of would actually be in focus so the kind of fogginess of what's to come and what's behind would be there. Um, we had to build five entrance structures. Um, this was really about a kind of uh, wayfinding as well as an introduction. Um, has everybody been to the LACMA kind of knows? Yeah. Well, it's in there. <laughs> um, yeah, that's well, not a show, but you sort of know. I mean, you either walk into a gallery and there's something sort of built in there. We don't have the luxury of this space uh, because there was something like, we can't remember now, but it's outrageous. There were something like 900 objects, art objects, and 1,200 works of ephemera that had to be crammed into these galleries. So we had to sort of make space by building these structures that would help orient people into the exhibition, but also um, well, orient them physically, and I would say orient them conceptually. And so that's why these structures are different configurations based on uh, the situation in which they were placed. Um, and the other thing that you're going to, you, you can kind of see, and I'll show you details, are these timeline image walls. Again, to give people a sense of the context um, of the exhibition and what they were going to see when they walked in there. Um, 
I want to reiterate, because I'm not going to explain this very well, that this was about art in California measured or uh, in contradiction, in conflict, in confirmation, in complication to the images that were being distributed about California. So it felt very important to actually show people what the complexity of images were that were circulating during that period, what people were seeing. And that was uh, and also included in these timeline image walls was factual data. So it kind of gave a historical overview of the period. So here are some details. Um, this is actually, we, we actually started integrating uh, real materials in here, real objects. Um, one of the things that we quickly discovered is that um, we are in the modern age. You can't clear rights on all those images. Um, and so if you show the actual objects, there's no problem clearing rights. And so this has become something that institutions are doing more frequently, which is getting on eBay and acquiring objects um, so that they don't have to worry about rights clearance because that's very time consuming and can also be very expensive. So in other words, when you're trying to use an image out of a publication, you can go back to the publication of the original photographer, but you're going to have to pay to do that. Sometimes it's a couple of hundred dollars and sometimes they want quite a bit of money, especially if it's a really significant image. Um, so of course Disney was not going to give us permission. So they can't stop us if it's an actual hat. These little objects right here um, were sort of littered throughout these timelines and they actually show the population shifts in California. Here's another detail down here. Um, we also did this extensive wayfinding system. I, as I think about this, it's just unfathomable now. <laughs> my school budget we had to do the whole exhibition. Um, we sort of got suffered, but it was a good, it was a really amazing experience. Um, the system used for wayfinding was quite straightforward and quite simple. They identified each of the sections by these big numbers and again by these colors. But what I made was uh, what I designed because it, there was really no way and no budget to do something fancy in terms of how the signage would exist. So these are made out of vinyl and they're what I call garments or I call them dresses. <laughs> so they dress different objects um, around the institution. So here's, here's this little dress that went on um, this, uh, this uh, what do you call it here? <laughs> this column here. And then uh, this, this object, this little garment here went on existing stanchions. And here is my dressing. Uh, one of these little stanchions. Um, after this was over, we wanted to put, a web, put, a, put together a website for ourselves. So this is not for LACMA. Um, this was something that we started <laughs> on as a big experiment to try and uh, show people what we had done for this exhibition. I may have to sort of like go out, go backstage, because I'm not sure how this is going to run in here. Um, but we'll see. No, this isn't going to run. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit here for just one moment. the site looks like. Um, actually, well, oh, this is very interesting. Um, we're actually on the second page of the site. So I think you briefly saw on the site that I showed you, like those images, those cliched images, the rolling along. And then you click on the Maid, and it switches from Maine, California to Made by Durfee Rain Sandhouse. And this was also trying to explain how we operated, so these kinds of hybrid practices. So you can see these little dots, maybe pause. No, they're not going to do it, but they, they sort of pause and form uh, neologism so, or, or hybrid terms so that we do everything from media info to info communications to spaces design. Um, 
to architecture info. And maybe we're going to get in here. Okay. Then one of the things that I was playing with here was it seems like the information, the layers of information within the site needed to be contextualized by the layers that preceded and followed it. So this system I call ghost holes and shadows or holes and ghosts. So that you can either penetrate through a layer or a window or you can see the trace of what preceded it. So here you're actually seeing the ghost of what preceded this. Remember this? So you can actually click and go back through that ghost back into what was. Or um, you go on. And this is the text that again sort of both explained who we are and what this project was about. And now we've got a hole. And we go through the hole in order to get to the next part of the site. I, sorry, I don't know what happened to the type here, um, but somewhere in updates, the type got scurry. Um, each of these, then we go to something more conventional. This, by the way, you click and you can email us. Um, but let's see, I can show you a little bit more of the plaza he here. That would probably help. No, we're not going to look at anything. Okay. All right, if anybody has any questions, just yell them out. Or I'd confuse somebody or... Well, no, it's not still online. It's disappeared. I should put it back up. No, I don't think they did. They might have had some sort of announcement. I don't know. Uh, Um, this is another website project I did <laughs> for a client who fired me um, <laughs> after I did the, the design. Um, they, they fired me because I couldn't do the site quickly enough. That was two years ago. They still have the This again is a, a movie. Uh, the restaurant's called Eche. I don't know if anybody's been to it. It's in Venice. Um, so it was divided uh, into uh, these two main areas, food and space. So these uh, texts would actually be sort of drifting down here. Uh, here we have food, and so you just, I mean, it's a very simple site. You can get the menus here. I think the last image will show a menu. So this was just a, a scrollable menu. Um, another exhibition, uh, the great wide open panoramic photographs of the American West. This was done for the, uh, the Huntington Library and Gardens out in San Marino. Um, they, have a, they have a small gallery there, and uh, that's where this exhibition took place. Um, these were panoramic photographs, so very long photographs, um, that represented the American West. Uh, there were two curators involved in this project, and they were just, they were fabulous to work with. Um, and they had these ideas about um, concepts of the West and how concepts of the West are actually built by the media that we see, in other words, images of the West. And so they were trying to explain this through the exhibition. Now, when we walked into this gallery, it was cubicles of spaces. And what we did was we knocked everything out, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this was a kind of uh, identity that we did for the exhibition. Um, I just showed this to a, a museum in the Midwest, and they were sort of freaked out about the typography here. 
Um, they couldn't believe we actually showed a contemporary typeface instead of something historical. Um, but again, we were working with these great curators who really did want to contextualize this in the current time. Um, this was the, the entrance. Um, and you turn the corner and you walk through the door here. And what, you're, what you see when you get around the corner there is um, this window, this panoramic window looking into the gallery and actually an explanation of what a panorama is because um, the nature of what it, was, what it is was central to the understanding of what this exhibition was about. Um, embedded in the, I'm going to just go back for a minute here, embedded in this window here, you can sort of barely see it, are these uh, viewfinder lenses when looking through them, it actually turns the vista of the gallery into um, a panorama. And what it also did was there was little tiny type in there. This is not the best representation. But you actually saw panoramically how the exhibition was laid out. And because we've knocked everything out of it, you could actually survey the entire exhibition through these lenses. And you've got different panoramas depending on which lens you looked at. So here we are. We're at the other side there. And there's uh, Pete, uh, who is uh, looking through the window there into the gallery. Um, the structures that we've built, and again, I, I do want to emphasize that the exhibitions that I've done are with Derpy Rain Sandhouse. Um, we, of course, what was needed was space to actually hold the works of art. But it seems really significant that we also had this sense of the wide open space. So um, what Tim and Iris did was they mapped the negative space of the galleries. And then the remaining space uh, was used for this structure um, that had these kinds of flip up walls. And with the suspending of the work, it actually gave us enough space to show all the works in the exhibition. Those of you who have done exhibitions, probably not many, know that this is, this becomes a real problem. Where do we put the art? Um, so, uh, and we always, to the curious, I always want way too much art. Um, the, the graphics in here, again, we have the same modern graphics here, um, were large scale so that when you were sort of surveying the place, you could see these different regions defined. So there was pathway, site, um, tribe. Uh, I'm not going to remember the other ones, but we'll probably see them. Um, the definition of these terms would actually wrap around the gallery. So here's some other vistas into the gallery. And you can see a bit of the text there. So there are more sort of territories and demarcated areas. Yeah. With, I'm sorry, what was? Oh, um, yeah, this is um, some of the public institutions, of course, we have to follow the ADA guidelines. So that's actually done anyway. Yeah, there was no problem negotiating um, a wheelchair through here at all. Um, the labels. I think we're okay. Hi. Because this is a private institution, we didn't have to exactly follow ADA. But negotiating, uh, this, um, this isn't a pathway through here. Sorry, pulling at my own screen. This is not a pathway through here. So there was enough space around those structures to negotiate. Yeah. Um, and this was. Uh, this was a structure that we had to build to actually hold a panoramic photograph. This was by Moybridge, and this is by a contemporary photographer. I'm not remembering, remembering the name. Take out the same location um, that Moybridge did this photo. I think it was at the uh, end of the 19th century. Um, and so we built a structure to be able to compare the two photographs. Um, 
project that's gone on for a long time <laughs> in my life and has now come to an end. But it, it gave me space to kind of learn a lot and make a lot of mistakes and try a lot of stuff. Um, it's called the Aaron Bodies and it, um, it was a journal for a long time and now it's more or less a press. And I've lost track of how many things I've designed, but I'm probably around eight or so. And I'm just going to show a few uh, things from there. This is the journal. Um, I also wanted to show this to show you, yes, occasionally I do do sexy graphic design. Um, so this is the cover. There are different uh, topics. So this was uh, uh, flowers, of course. This was toys. Um, they really were a place the, the journal was really targeted um, to be able to somehow present the works of artists who actually used words, that their, their site actually was a publication. Um, so that's what uh, this publication was trying to uh, create a space for that to happen. This is just uh, one of the spreads from, uh, from the toy publication. Uh, this actually, oh no, sorry, this is flowers. Um, the the uh, artist actually put rose petals in each of the books. Um, this is more recent. Um, this has a story behind it, and there are many Dutch people in here, so <laughs> I will relate this story. Um, I had uh, gone to Holland a couple years ago and was sort of amazed by all the default design going on. I think I've talked about this in my class here as well. Um, and was just sort of concerned about um, this lack of actually using visual evidence as a kind of expression, both in terms of uh, relating meaning, but also as a, as a means of engagement with the material. So I decided to take a default everything and just sort of see where I could go with it. And so I used this publication as that, as that experiment. Um, first, I generously had students and some other colleagues um, draw pictures of radios for me. The project was the documentation of uh, Kunst Radio in, uh, in Vienna, which actually broadcasts um, works of art that are broadcast related, audio related. Um, so this was to document this, this project and to talk about the social space of radio and so that's why I had all these drawings of radios done and then just uh, overlap them. Um, so it's a little cardboard book uh, with this, uh, with the publication inside it. Um, there's a CD in the back and um, I just just used a, all the default typefaces that come with the computer, Helvetica, um, Courier, and uh, Verdana. And uh, any images other than uh, what I already had scanned, I, uh, I photographed. So um, the, uh, the table of contents is running across the top. So you can uh, locate yourself any, anywhere in the book. Uh, here I go with uh, trying to work with the default typography expressively. <laughs> here are uh, Achim Volscheid, uh, a um, German artist, uh, his work. Um, and here's his work annotated. Here's some more default typography and radio. Um, this is a, another project, uh, the last project uh, for Air Bodies Press. Um, and this came out recently. And this is about uh, the relationship of uh, works of art to their site, well, which was already something that I was interested in because of the, that I work with, a, I work in a kind of uh, site specificity or the way that I look at things is about the specificity of the kind of site no matter what um, media that is. Um, and also because I work with works of art in, um, in settings in which they're displayed. So I'm just going to page through this book. Um, one of the things about it that you'll see in a minute, um, here is the, 
Well, here's the introduction. And I actually did an experiment with the introduction to see there seemed to be sort of key things about reading this book. There were key points that needed to be brought out in order to understand what this publication is about. And I didn't want people to have to read this whole introduction, but to actually be able to scan through the book and sort of get a sense of what this was about. So the key statements were pulled out and, and represented in larger text. And the size of the text in between was sized so that it would fit the page. So the size of the type is changing as you go through this introduction. So that gives you an idea, and that's the end. Um, this was actually, um, I don't think you're going to get much of a sense of this, but this is actually a symbol system. There are three major kinds of text in here. Um, documentations of projects, um, uh, essays, and works that were site specific to this book. And so each kind of work would get a different symbol. So this is where I just page through the book. Um, the other thing that you kind of see here is that I asked the printer to use whatever paper was on the floor. So that sort of the site of the stories themselves would, um, would shift so that there was a kind of parallel narrative, so to speak, going through in the paper while the text itself was representing a whole other narrative. So there was kind of two simultaneous spaces. There actually were blank pages in here, drawing. Anyway, that gives you a sense of it. Um, this was another exhibition. This is for the Hammer Museum um, called The World From Here, Treasures of the Great Libraries of Los Angeles. Um, this is my dream project. This was a project. I actually started thinking about exhibitions when uh, Lorraine Wilde's work was shown at SFMOMA. And it was so frustrating, the whole idea of it, because you couldn't really understand what that work was. You know, here it was these sort of objects in cases. And really the experience of the book is an object and also a system and a structure and an idea played out in time was incomprehensible. And so I actually wanted to do a show with books and uh, see what could be done to enliven that experience of books. Um, also, my partners and I had gone to see this exhibition um, of uh, another, I think it was the Utopia show in New York at the New York Public Library, which was an amazing show, but we were totally frustrated trying to see these works because there'd be like some big old case and you'd be plunking your head trying to look at this object that was just so amazing, but you couldn't get near it. Um, the other thing that I want to say about this is that when, when they called us in to do this exhibition, we thought, it gave us this title and we thought, what? <laughs> Treasures of the Great Libraries of Los Angeles? Surely there's a bigger idea than that. And then as we got into the show, we realized, no, there wasn't a bigger idea than that. <laughs> it was treasures and well, well um, entitled or well titled because these were astounding works that I had no idea were in the libraries of Los Angeles. So from every perspective, this was a dream project. Um, so what we did identify for them, what we often do in our working process is actually make comprehensive booklets for the client, trying to feed back to them what we think that they've told us the exhibition is about, so that we're really clear um, and uh, that we can begin to move forward in, uh, in designing the exhibition from there, because we know what it is that the exhibition is trying to communicate or trying to relate. Um, so the world from here, in this case, was here, Los Angeles, here, the book, and here, the libraries of Los Angeles. And so this kind of like here becomes uh, a, a kind of marker for the exhibition. Um, this is the space where the exhibition uh, took place. You all have probably been to the Hammer, right? Sort of 
for the last picture show, is that what it's called? It just, just happened in New Mexico show that to open. So there's a kind of little vestibule here, little entry area. Um, then uh, you walk into this big space that a lot of times is subdivided. It actually had walls. Um, when we were here, we got to knock them down because uh, they were going to go into construction after our show. We're still waiting for that construction, but we got to knock the walls out here. And then there's a second big gallery here. Um, these are structures that uh, we built that uh, Tim and Iris designed to actually um, help people navigate through this space. And you'll see it helped contain uh, this what could have been overwhelming. There was about, I think, 500 objects in this show. Um, so again, back to the X motif. So this big X wraps the entrance of the exhibition, or the entrance doors. And then you walk in here, um, and uh, this identifies uh, the libraries that participated. And we actually changed the hierarchy of the title here, because we thought it was really important so that people wouldn't walk in here thinking this was some great theme going on in this exhibition. So uh, we, we uh, uh, changed the hierarchy to have treasures, libraries in Los Angeles featured. Um, I have to say that I, I mean, for every disappointment about this entrance, my original design had gold X's that, <laughs> that were scattered about the wall, like the wall was a map, only you didn't see the map. And it had these like gold vinyl X's with pink lights on it, because I just wanted to sort of identify these. It's, kind of like looking at the idea that they would call these treasures, but also identify um, the, well, I guess also sort of inflect this idea that usually we think of treasures in Los Angeles or Hollywood as being movie stars, so it would have that sort of movie star. Um, it would get a, um, uh, um, instead of a, a star, it would get an X for each of the libraries. Um, but they were really flipped out about that idea. So we did something a bit straighter. Um, so here you are entering the gallery. Just for a moment, kind of ignore this. But um, again, as I mentioned a minute ago, you could have walked in there and just seen like books everywhere and gone, oh my god, I need a rest. So we wanted to control that, but we also, um, we, we also wanted to sort of vary the experience, so there are different display conditions. This is actually a display condition here. And these are these uh, structures um, that you'll see in a minute, whole books. But um, there were conservation issues here. These books are very precious, and so they, they need really low light levels. Um, so um, we sort of turned these uh, structures into lanterns so that you wouldn't walk in there and feel like you were in the dark, and so that we were also able to control the light. Um, these, the, uh, we, we used the X motif again here. These were actually on the floor and um, identified the different uh, sections of the show. I think there were seven sections in this show. Um, so we just sort of turned the corner here and uh, so here's uh, one of the areas of books. I'll talk about these in a minute, but each section had something that we called an, an attractor. Because we couldn't, um, we wanted people to like, have an intimate experience with these books, but of course you can't show every book. We wanted larger ideas about books, books as objects, um, books as, um, as uh, sort of seminal in terms of ideas. Um, books with different kinds of information. Um, we wanted people to have experience of those, and so we, um, so we have these seven different attractors, which I'll show you some of. The other thing that you can kind of see here, these, I have to, I have to give a lot of credit to Tim and Iris because I would have gone nuts if I had to do this. They actually got all the information, but the books that are opened, um, because these are very precious objects, they can only be opened so much. You know, so we think of books as we try and lay them flat, but these books sometimes could only be opened like this much. You can see that. And then there was also, because of the drag or the weight, they could only be tilted up so much. So we, what Tim and Eris did was figured out 
how close, if we curved this glass here, a plexiglass here, how close could we get the objects up to the plexiglass so that you could feel as if you were looking right in that book? Um, so all these display conditions were customized. We nearly killed ourselves trying to do that, but I think it, it really helped people to experience these works. Um, we were able to pretty much control the reflection because the lights are within. Um, there are some conditions where they're above, but we sort of carefully monitored that. So here you're seeing another section. And here is an entrance to a reading room, which is also the bridge between the two large galleries. There's a little kind of ramp up, so we really wanted this to have a different sensibility of a space. So here, here you are in the reading room, and that mass that I wanted with simulated gold stars and no pink light is there, um, and it gives indication of where each of the libraries that contributed works are there. And I didn't put any pictures in here, but I have to say, the Louise M. Darling <laughs> Medical Library here at UCLA is a treasure trove of books um, on what you would think was a very dry and uninteresting subject, their medical text, but they're really sexy, juicy, funny, interesting books. And I highly recommend you uh, call Catherine, the librarian, and say, can I come see those books? Because she really loves to share them. Um, this is sort of looking back. So, uh, that map is over here on this wall, and so you come from this section and walked up this ramp into the reading room. And you can see that the lighting conditions here are much different. Um, and this is what the, the last gallery looked like. I'll show you some, oh, here's another image. Um, here's the, um, here's what I was talking about in terms of the uh, attractors. So here we have this uh, book, which is the first directory, oh my god, that's backwards, of the residents of Los Angeles. And of course, it's very cool to thumb through it and to look and see who was here, how many people were here, and what kinds of things were being advertised, which I think is the most fun. Um, here's the book right here, the original work. We actually scanned each of the pages and reproduced it in books so that people could actually look through those books. Um, this is another uh, attractor, and these were books that were actually um, final books about printing um, and or used as examples of printing. And what we did here was we had these uh, sliding panels so that you could annotate the book and uh, get additional information. It kind of looked like this. So when you're looking down over it, um, you could see these annotations and get specific information um, about uh, what these books uh, um, reference in terms of typography. This is, this is a, a Jeffrey Torrey, uh, which is one of the first books about typography, and he's comparing letter forms to the face. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, here we had, and we had actually, this client was a bit nervous about digital technology, <laughs> so we actually had to do videos of these books so paging through these books. This is an amazing, amazing book about uh, costumes for a festival. Is that what it's about, Lauren? Yeah, it had these incredible hand-done illustrations inside of it. And of course, people were dying to look at this so that they could see the video here. We, we t as a tendency of the way that we present, ex that we present media and exhibitions, we actually present it uh, horizontally rather than vertically, because if there's a TV in the room, everybody goes for the TV. So um, we, we, we try and get it out of the vista range. Um, this was another one. This, you're seeing part of it here, but we actually made a human body out of these medical texts. So um, you, can, you can barely make out, but actually this human body that you're seeing here is overlaying these books. Um, these are um, some of the other display conditions that I talked about. So this condition where the books are sort of lifted up and this condition where there's just a, like a plexi just uh, covering them and they're sunken in. 
And just to show you the, uh, how the uh, didactics were handled here. Again, with fairly contemporary typefaces, all California design typefaces. Um, and there was a reading rail so that there were no problems with labels in the cases so that we really didn't have to worry about people being able to see the, the objects and the labels simultaneously. This was a, an insane system where I spent days in the gallery hand cutting the labels <laughs> and placing them neatly into um, the reading rail. Um, Okay, so I said this was the big and small of this and that. I saw it in a wedding invitation because um, I really like this, but also um, I spent months designing a, a wedding invitation for these people. On the day it was supposed to deliver from the printer, I got a FedEx, which I think is the invitation, but no, it's a letter saying, sorry, we've decided not to print this invitation. It's too complicated and we think you'll be unhappy. So here it is the day that my friends are supposed to be mailing out their wedding invitations, and they had no wedding invitations. So they were like, we're calling off the wedding. <laughs> 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 that for a few minutes. My friends were surprised me. I called them back and told them you are going to do this. So um, I did. I called them back, and I said, meet me at the paper place in the morning, 9 a.m. And so we uh, <laughs> We picked out the papers, I designed it that night, got it to the party the next day, and lo and behold, in five days, they had these wedding invitations. So it really was just using, which you can kind of barely see, and I actually brought a sample. I brought a sample of a few things, you can look at it more closely. But different papers and different textures and different finishes and just different inks, and so it just made this jolly little thing, and I think we all liked it better than the one I spent months on. Um, here's another show, I have to say, if there was a disaster in my life, this was the disaster. <laughs> but I thought it was important to show you the experiments I've done, the, the successes that you can probably see how I've learned and kind of grown through these projects. This is a project for, um, uh, I, will, I will not name the institution, nor will I name the curators um, that we did this for. Um, but in all of this was going to go awry when they handed me the logo for this exhibition about American identity that was done in DIN, the national typeface of Germany. And so <laughs> it was about race. So it was yellow, yellow, black, white, brown, and red. So we had to kind of <laughs> negotiate this. Um, so, um, <laughs> this is like, this is like, dirty. <laughs> this is a modified color um, for, the, uh, for the title of the exhibition. Um, and this is the sign that to the end of the exhibition never went up announcing the show. Um, I really have scattered images here, so I apologize. Uh, they, they didn't think it was worth their time for us to photograph. Uh, the exhibition, so uh, we, we have a bunch of snapshots. But the, um, what we had, I mean, was a few, the, they let us in for half a day to photograph this exhibition professionally. But um, what we had to deal with here, aside from insane curators, was um, a situation where there was lots of different kinds of objects, large-scale contemporary works of art, and um, and um, archival photographs, very precious, small photographs and books. And um, then there was also a fair amount of media. So we had to figure out, like, well, how are we going to contain and negotiate this? Now, the other reason why this was such a frustrating exhibition was because the conceptual ideas of the exhibition were very, very complex. And we felt like they needed to be tightly controlled in the display conditions in order for anybody to be able to grasp the concepts of this exhibition. And this was, we were working with this curator who, and this sounds very strange, but I found that it's pretty common in curators that they can't see. They're not visual people. And that seems very strange because they're working with visual objects. But we were working with a curator who literally couldn't see. She'd be describing the picture on the wall, you know, a black woman engaging with a white man, and she'd go, 
look at how that woman is demurring. <laughs> no, no, she's like staring at a stick. And so <laughs> we would be like, oh my God, you know, what are we going to do here? And in the end, we just, we just had to sort of like let them put the work up wherever the hell they wanted. And we just had to kind of, you know, temper everything. Um, so uh, these, well, I'm just going to skip past this. Um, we built these structures, is, is what we did, or two in Eras did, so that the works um, that were media works and the works that were smaller could be contained in one structure. So these structures contain cases, and I'll show you more images here. Um, also, because it's a very small space, we put these windows in here so you wouldn't go in there and go, oh my god, get me out of here. Um, and you'll begin to see that this is a shape that curves back and forth so that we're able to use the negative and positive spaces. So inside, the negative spaces are, what are on the outside become the positive spaces for holding media. And the positive spaces on the outside of the structure become cases and hold objects. So here we are inside uh, this structure. I didn't order these well at all. Here's kind of showing, oh, here we are at the beginning. This is really out of order. I apologize. This is just one of the gallery conditions. Again, we have uh, um, the monitors in a, in a vertical situation. Here you're looking in one of the cases and can see the objects. And here you see somebody looking in here. Also, this was a less small space, so we put a translucent um, material through there. So I'm just going to go back so that this makes some sense. Oh, so this is the, this is the structure that you were just on the outside of. So that transparent wall was right there and right there. And here you can kind of get a sense of the gallery. The structure wove through one of the galleries and came out the other. Here's where that yellow window is. And you can begin to see here through this little composite that I did kind of the sense of the conditions that we were dealing with. So here's the media embedded in these negative spaces. Here's one of these windows. Here's another window. So, you know, again, you're not sort of overwhelmed by media and there's not little things all over the place. So we tried to contain it. So it really was like this completely functional project rather than conceptual. But one tiny thing we got to do was what we suggested to them because this, this, uh, these works were not about the artist at all. They were really about the images. So we asked them to take completely de-emphasize, or not completely, but really lower the hierarchy on the artist and how that was represented and way amp out up the title of these works because it was actually sort of standing through through the uh, titles and the exhibition that you also got more of an idea about what the concept of these works were, uh, well, how they were functioning within the concept of this exhibition. Um, this is a project I'm working on with Lorraine Wilde, who I hope you all saw a few weeks ago. Um, I'm almost finished, by the way. Just going to show this in one other project. Um, this is uh, a book project that uh, is in the works called uh, Earthquakes, Mudslides, Fires, and Riots, California and Graphic Design. And um, what this is trying to look at is um, why, what are the contextual conditions under which certain form emerges? And California is really this place of very rich cultural conditions and some really amazing work um, that actually deserves to be sort of segmented from the larger body of American design and sort of discussed and surveyed and um, its treasures pulled out. Um, see, I'm sticking with that word now, treasures. Um, so it's really looking at this amazing form and what were the conditions in California that brought about this amazing form. Um, and it's being done as a series of fictional exhibition catalogs. So these are actually sort of 
fictional curated exhibitions, and so it's sort of looking back at this work. Um, each of these books will have its own personality, its own voice, its own look, and uh, what I actually want to do is glue the covers together so there are these little books. Um, so I'm just going to show a few of the images. Um, and these are, these are all over the place. So you have to think of it like some of the books, um, well, like one of the books was called Sun Baked Modernism. So what happens to modernism when it gets to Los Angeles? And um, there's a, another book um, called, um, let's see if I remember the title, well, The Babes, all the, all the Gals Who Have Designed in California, which there seems to be a preponderance of. Um, there's a book about um, motion graphics called um, uh, the, uh, oh, Lorraine, what is it called? The, the, the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's something about uh, those who are working with in Hollywood and those who have worked outside of Hollywood. So um, what we've been trying to do and what I'll really concentrate on this summer with, with some graduate students is trying to dig up um, hidden archives. So these are just a few of the things that we found. Uh, we've all forgotten, or I have forgotten, about uh, Disneyland. And there's some pretty amazing graphics that took place in the 50s and the 70s for Disneyland. Um, this is this, uh, I'm not going to remember all the people that, that did these objects, but this, this is this crazy sign for Cal State uh, University, Northridge, where you move around it and it still spells CISA. <laughs> No matter what direction you move around, it's just, it's completely insane. Um, this is the uh, work of, um, oh my God. Williams, thank you. Oh, let's see about it. Robert Williams, who really, um, you know, <laughs> yes, this is very funny. It's the beats who are trying to figure out the beats, and the beats are trying to figure out the beats. Um, <laughs> And it's a beat mix beat. So this was, um, a, you know, a, a sort of um, arch <laughs> that was that was going. On. I look at it. This, I'm looking at it as graphic design. And again, you know, as I started talking about at the beginning, I'm looking at other kinds of models of graphic design. So that's why this is uh, very wide in terms of what it includes. Um, but uh, this person actually, you guys know Mad Magazine, right? You've seen Mad Magazine. Well, way back, I mean, it was really the counterculture magazine that was about the, the youth um, starting to kind of question this, um, this uh, lifestyle that just seems very protected and very safe and very American. There's uh, another one. This is real Mad Magazine to me. Look at this poor kid. I wonder what he's been doing. Um, so this is one of the treasures that I dug up. Um, this is this is actually sort of reappeared several times recently. There was a show of uh, the archives of Cal Arts about a year ago, and it appeared there. But um, and the Lorraine gave me this. The Lorraine Wild gave me this years ago. But I really started looking at it and realized what, it, what an interesting document it is. It's actually done by Sheila de Bratville, and it was a document that was um, introducing uh, Cal Arts. And so it goes through this narrative of somebody um, like uh, um, uh, trying to go to Cal Arts and find out about it, and simultaneously there's all this sort of documentation uh, written by the board and written by Disney of what this institution is. So um, I only have these two pages here, but you know, it's like a 64-page document or 100-page document that's quite, quite interesting, quite conceptual. Um, this is um, Wallace Bowman, who probably is better known as an artist, but he actually did um, some more sort of commercial projects, and this is actually for a film festival. Uh, this is Denise Gonzalez Christ, who is the art director at Art Center. So there is contemporary work in here, just to show that. Um, and of course, uh, people like Pablo Ferro um, doing motion. Sorry, that's so small there. Is it his title for Dr. Strangelove? And um, then there's uh, type. So this is uh, Fairplex out of uh, Emma Grayson. 
the mice to San Alico. Um, this is something you've probably never seen. This is Frances Butler, two of her works. Um, she owned a small press called Paltrian Press in the 70s, 80s, and I think she finally departed in the in the early to mid 90s and went to live on a uh, in France, in southern France, and grow a garden. Have you heard from her? Um, <coughs> anybody heard from her? No. <laughs> She's still there. Okay. Um, She's still there. Should she go back from France? Oh, all right. Anyway, so these are very odd works, I believe, done in the 70s. Um, and then uh, Paul Landacre, so also looking at these kind of small presses that were fine presses, but also did some unique projects. Uh, he had a small press, but also did these beautiful engravings. Um, so this last thing I'm going to show um, is this website that we're currently working on. Now, this was really important for us to get this project. I'm actually doing it with just one of my partners, Tim Durf, because I said we reconfigure as needed. Actually, Tim doesn't really do websites, but he's this amazing thinker, and so I really wanted him to contribute to this. Now, when we started, if you remember, we started, um, when I started talking about the process of my working and these kind of great discoveries, I showed that that uh, software that I did for Tricon and the process of kind of like figuring out what this needed to, to be and how I needed to work, what the working process needed to be that's really informed everything that I've done. So I don't think of myself as an exhibition designer. I don't think of myself as a web designer. Um, I don't think of myself as a book designer. I'm just a graphic designer, and for me, that contains everything. And so it was a real opportunity for somebody to see that it didn't matter the kinds of forms that I was working in or the spaces. It was still about this idea of being able to um, translate um, what, what something was trying to communicate to a particular audience into something that was informative and engaging, regardless of the media. Um, so I'm going to go out of here and over to here. Oh, actually, well, well this is shutting down. This is the interface for um, this uh, um, site. Um, I may have to launch that again. Yeah. be up in a couple of weeks. It's not finished. It's in heavy duty midst of production. Sorry. So this was designed most of the uh, Oh, please load. Okay. Well, oh, wrong. Okay. So this is this, uh, an exhibition that's about to open at the LA County Museum of Art, and it has. Um, it's, the work is really about, it's really about system-based work and how that ends up leading into conceptualism. So this is uh, work that's post-World War II um, that's taking place in Europe, North America, and South America. And um, we wanted the, the uh, interface to be very systematic and to be very concrete. So rather than using symbology or iconology, iconography, we wanted as much as possible to have, um, to, to just be very straightforward in the information. So we also wanted people to be able to navigate and find out about the exhibition 
however was uh, best for them and what was uh, the way in which they wanted to uh, get something about the exhibition. So the users for this site are um, people before the exhibition who just want to kind of check it out. Um, during the exhibition, there's going to be kiosks. And then um, after the exhibition, to kind of like get more sort of reflection. And then people who don't go to the exhibition at all who are actually um, doing research. Um, so the way that the site is divided is um, that there actually is uh, text about the sections of the exhibition. Remember, this is not finished. And so there are a lot of refinements that are still going on. You can select um, uh, a text here and read it. Um, if you prefer, you can go to the uh, glossary if, say, you're in the exhibition and you just uh, don't understand a term and want a deeper understanding. Um, if you want to find out about an artist while you're in the exhibition, you can go there. Uh, if there's a piece of artwork in the exhibition, which you're intrigued, you can go to the artwork. Uh, there will also be some videos in here. Um, it's, everything is hyperlinked, so while you're looking at Joseph Albers' Amish to the Square, you can also find out about Joseph Albers. Um, there's a timeline. I don't think this is... Whoa! Okay, so this is the... Whoa! <laughs> okay, uh, so there's a timeline there. <laughs> Not a fat cow. And we saw for like a half a second, I'll try and reload this, that uh, you'll actually be able to see the simultaneous information um, taking place in the three re regions that the exhibition covers so North America, South America, and Europe. No. No, sorry. Oh, there it is. Okay, we saw it for half a second. Um, and up here, and this is like, this is all hyperlinked. You can kind of see here. Um, this is going to be these dialogues um, between two mysterious people um, having these conversations. The reason that we did this, and hopefully it'll be really fun and playful, um, is because most of these ideas are really hard for people to understand. So hopefully through these really playful conversations, people will be able to grasp what materialism is and conceptualism and system-based work. Um, so anyway, that's the end. The site will be up in a few weeks. You can look at it at LACMA.org. And thank you, everybody, for sitting so patiently. <laughs>
the reason that we use that type thing was because it was actually built on a historical type basis, and so embodied in something contemporary looks in history, and so we wanted that represented. But again, we try not to get nostalgic or sentimental or romantic about our show. We're actually trying to think in the contemporary times, and we're the curators that we're working with, that's what they're interested in. Thank you. Do you want to sing for us? Anybody else? You show us a lot of different work, yeah. and uh, I'm going to ask you this question anyways, although I'm afraid you're going to say that you love everything. Uh -huh. But what about your biggest love? Is that in the books? Is that in the museum exhibitions? Is that in websites? Could you, could you say something about that? Well, I'm going to say a couple of things about that. Um, I really, you know, well, my subtitle <laughs> about being a graphic designer. A lot of it, a lot of why I switch to media so often is because it's just boredom. You know, once you've learned it, you know, and then you can kind of dish it out, it's not so interesting. Um, so that's part of the reason why there's such a diversity of my work, but also it's you know, when I showed that first poster, the 101 poster, I realized, you know, I mean, this was the time when people were starting to email the internet and starting to um, uh, be widely enough distributed among people that, you know, you could communicate to your friends. In fact, I was like stuck in this provincial little town in the Netherlands in my own way. <laughs> to the outside world was being able to email people um, back in the States. And, um, just sort of like seeing that how communications was going to take place, how I needed to communicate the idea of this exhibition or this, uh, this symposium, needed to, I needed to sort of switch my thinking about just assuming it was a, it was a poster that was going to get stuck up on in, uh, in places around God knows where. I mean, that's a really difficult distribution channel and it needed to reach wider audiences. So it really is sort of like, I don't start out, and this is part of the, the quote that I used from Arthur I try not to start out with the idea of what the form of the communication needs to be as a website or a, you know, a video or a book. It's just, um, it really grows out of what, how the communications would best be served. So, I like whatever I haven't done yet. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.